Okay, so right here in my hands, I am holding the brand new issue of Good Good Goods Good Newspaper. For those who don't know, the Good Newspaper is a print physical newspaper filled with the stories of the people, ideas, and movements that are shaping the world for the better. And while I love all of the stories on the inside, and oh my goodness, we've got some really amazing ones, people who are using mobile phones to help farmers grow bigger harvests, an app that helps teens with concussions heal, uh, the fact that Bill Gates wants to reinvent the toilet, we've got a Marie Kondo story, we've got so many good stories, but today I just want to highlight the design of the good newspaper. First of all, go to shop.goodgoodgood.co to just look at how beautiful this newspaper is. But when we started out, my goal was that the good newspaper would be a physical manifestation of good and that just by having it in your home, at your office, in your life, that it would maybe make people feel a little bit more hopeful about the state of the world, that they would maybe feel a greater desire to become a part of the good in the world. And that's why we work with world-class designers. Uh, our illustrator, her name is Kara Sykes. She's one of my favorite people. She's so talented. And the front cover that she designed is just beautiful. And it looks so good. I'm already seeing photos from people sharing uh, photos of this sitting on their coffee table, sitting in coffee shops. It looks beautiful to have in your life. But also, on the inside of this issue and every issue, we have what we call a centerfold poster. It comes free in every issue. It folds out. And it is beautiful. Every single issue, the poster is a quote from somebody who is just like this podcast, rejecting cynicism and using their lives to make an impact. And for this issue, we highlighted this beautiful quote from Dr. Maya Angelou, and it says, pick up the battle and make it a better world just where you are. And we brought on this incredibly talented designer. Her name is Joanna D. And we had her illustrate this beautiful poster. And I already have it hung up on my wall at home. It looks so good. And I want you guys to have this. I want this to be in your life if you need some good news in your life. So visit shop.goodgoodgood.co to pick up the good newspaper. You can subscribe and get a whole year of good news. You can just pick up the individual issue. You can pick up a dozen issues if you want to give them away to your friends, whatever works best for you. But I wanted you to know because we're so proud of this. We think it's so important and we could not do this without the support of this community. Anyway, that's everything that I wanted to say. I'm just so excited about this. Thank you. Now, here is this week's episode of Sounds Good. It's starting to feel like we are in a new political season. There's so many people announcing that they are running for president for the 2020 election. And I feel like I've just had... The same conversation maybe a dozen times over the last few weeks of what is this next year and a half going to look like? Is it is it going to feel divisive? Is it going to make us all feel cynical again? Or is there perhaps reason to hope? But, you know, the reality is I think that this question of how will this next season be is weighing on all of us. And it's definitely taken... Uh, a good amount of the real estate in my brain. But at the same time, even in the midst of a crazy political season, I've been kept sane by some of my absolute favorite people, Sarah Stewart Holland and Beth Silvers from the Pantsuit Politics podcast. They launched this podcast in November of 2015 with the goal of listening to each other first and having political conversations second. Even though Sarah is on the left of the political spectrum and Beth is on the right. If you've been listening to the podcast for a while now, you'll remember the very first time that I had Sarah and Beth on the podcast a few years ago. And we dove into their origin story. And I'm just so excited because uh, we have them back on the podcast this week. I just read their brand new book. It's called I Think You're Wrong, But I'm Listening. And I loved it, you guys. It was so helpful for me. Ultimately, it's a practical guide to grace-filled political conversation that ultimately challenges readers to put relationship before policy and understanding before argument. And 
I feel like I'm going to be applying a lot of what I learned from Sarah and Beth over kind of the next few months and over the next year. So I wanted to have them on the show to talk about some of my favorite themes from this book and a few of my favorite ideas that kind of stuck with me. Because I do feel like there is some reason to be hopeful about what this new political season can look like. And I think that I feel most hopeful about the conversations that I'm going to be able to have with uh, the people in my life. And that maybe there's a way to avoid angry, divisive, cynical thinking and conversations. And I think Sarah and Beth do that so well. Pantsuit Politics is a little bit of a big deal. They have been named one of the seven best political podcasts to listen to right now by Elle Magazine. They were named one of the top nine political podcasts to listen to in 2017 by The Guardian. And they were named one of five informative political podcasts you should listen to by Bustle. For those who don't know me, I am Brandon Harvey, and this is Sounds Good. This is the weekly podcast where we have conversations with inspiring people who are rejecting cynicism and using their lives to make an impact. Sounds Good is not your typical three steps to success podcast. We don't host this podcast for the sake of leaving you with just straight up bullet points for self-improvement. I just think that it's a lot more complex than that. And so we show up here on Sounds Good to ask big questions, to dive into nuance, and to learn from each other's stories. So without any further ado, let's just jump straight into this conversation with Sarah and Beth. Sarah and Beth, welcome back to the podcast. I'm so excited to get to be talking with you guys. I know that the last time we talked, uh, we were all together uh, here in Nashville. I know. I loved your little studio. It was the best. It was so fun to have you guys here in person. And you guys have got the freaking new book out and it's so good. And so I know that you guys have been busy. And so we're recording over the internet today. But I'm just so excited to kind of talk about this because I love the new book, love what you guys are doing. And also, now that everybody's announcing... Uh, that they're running for president, and we just had the midterms and all these things. Literally everyone, literally everyone. Every else. single human. <laughs> <laughs> I'm mm-hmm. excited to get to dive into a few of these things because I think that we're all trying to figure out what 2019, 2020 are going to look like, how we can kind of stay sane within it, how we can not be in conflict with the people we love, and how we can also focus on actually making the world a better place, not just like existing politics but but working together to create solutions and so thanks for being here thank you for having us yes thank you so much for those who haven't listened to our very first conversation together maybe we can kind of give a quick little primer on who each of you are how you came together um and kind of the creation of pantsuit politics and the other nuanced things that you're creating in the world Well, I am the designated origin storyteller of Pantsuit Politics. I am Sarah Stewart Holland from the left, and I had the idea for a podcast surrounding interviews with women in politics. I had worked in politics. I had just completed a training program for women interested in running for office back in 2015 when I had this idea. But I did an interview and I was like, mm, it's okay. I don't really, I'm not, I wasn't loving it. It just kind of sat there on my desktop. And then at, simultaneously, I had a blog. It was primarily focused on parenting, but I would occasionally talk about politics on the blog. And Beth, who I have known since college, we went to college together and we're in the same sorority, had stayed in touch through Facebook. And she reached out and said, hey, do you ever want sort of an opposite perspective on your blog about these political topics you write about? And I said, absolutely. I'm always looking for content for my blog. Bring it on, sister. And so she wrote some really amazing um, posts. I loved her style. I loved the way her brain worked. And so I thought, I reached out and I said, hey, what if we did a podcast where we work through these sort of opposing sides of issues in a very different way, a way we definitely weren't seeing in the media landscape. And she said, what's a podcast? And so I explained that part. And then we did a test call. I said, I'm going to call you and we'll just talk about politics and see how we like talking politics together. And we talked for an hour and I said, okay, we got something here. We're not going (laughs) to talk on the phone anymore unless we're recording it. And that is how Pantsy Politics was born. Beautiful. And I i mean, I'm a fan of the show. I have friends who are fans of the show who actually introduced me to you guys. And you guys have existed for how many years now? Three years. It's hard to believe. So you have maybe different political ideologies, but you also have a lot of things that 
you both have in common. You're both lawyers, mothers. You both live in Kentucky. Um, what else am I missing here? Probably lots of things. I mean, we both like Lake Street Dive. We both <laughs> like chocolate. <laughs> um, you know, the way that we talk about it a lot is that we have very similar values. They just play out differently in terms of policy. And that's what really facilitates our conversations. We try to first get down to what are our values council here? And then, okay, what is the manifestation of policy that comes from those values for each of us? And that's a very different way than people usually orient themselves in a political conversation. You know, because of the the our current polarized environment, people start from a place of no benefit of the doubt. We don't have anything in common. We are at opposite ends of everything. Now let's talk about something. Whereas mm -mm, that's not, it's not a great way to orient yourself. And so we try to think through the things we share, the places that we see commonalities, and then move forward based on that, that relationship of shared values, as opposed to the, you know, the tribalism of opposition. I think that it was either in your book or listening to an episode, but you, you mentioned that Early on, you had something called the Great Redhead Debate, and you kind of learned that it wasn't the right format, and that's when you kind of started to unpack how to better have conversations about, you know, different viewpoints and perspectives. Can you share a little bit about that experience and that pivot? We had this idea to try to do a debate because we were in kind of presidential season, and we hated the way debates were going on the national stage. And we thought, what would it sound like if we did a debate, but did it in more of our style? And what we realized is the format itself is the problem. It's not like take these people out. These people aren't the problem. Individual political figures are not the reason debates are useless. The format is why debates are useless, because even bringing everything that we were trying to cultivate in terms of nuance and respect and kindness in our conversation, we really found ourselves slipping into our roles because the whole point of a debate is to draw out contrast. And what we realized is like there's plenty of contrast. We're all practicing contrast constantly. What we really need to get to is connection and we just can't do that in that format. How does that work when you have potentially, you know, two diverging political figures up on a stage or maybe in a better situation, not up on a stage? Where does connection come into that? Like, where does seeing Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton connect on stage benefit? Yeah, maybe flesh it out a little bit more for me. Well, we're not going to start with Hillary and Donald. <laughs> Probably for the well, best. Not, that's not going to be our starting point. <laughs> that's good. Um, but what we are looking for is, let's say, you know, my father voted for Donald Trump. I did not. When I talk with him, and he's led the way on this. He was doing this um, when I was in college, and I was much more interested in being in very conflict-driven conversations with him. But in that scenario, we would lead with our connection that we're going to prioritize our relationship as father and daughter. We're going to remember that we love each other and we have a shared connection together and that though we see the world very differently, we both, we both want what's best for the country and we both want what's best for my children, my sons and his grandsons, and sort of just keep that as our, our focal point instead of you're wrong, you're terrible, Everything you think is in opposition to everything I think. There's nothing here to focus on. And you, and you can mm. see those conversations, I think, more in the culture than you could, but they're still few and far between. And I think the reason connection would be valuable, even in a contest um, like the presidential contest, is that understanding through contrast is a very superficial way to understand, okay, now I understand what you're against, right, and maybe on some level what you're for. When you have a conversation that's about connection and you really say, where are we aligned? How do we both define this problem? Sometimes we don't even understand that, right? People are defining problems differently. So it's not just that they offer different solutions. It's that they're living in two different universes. When you start with connection and build out from there, 
then we as a voting public would really get to see how people think and make decisions, which is so much more important for a president. You know, this is not a legislator who's just voting up or down on different bills. This is a person who has to make extremely complex decisions. So being able to follow their thought process, I think, would be so much more valuable to us than the current debate format provides. And you can see that. I mean, there were some really beautiful moments with the Democratic primary contestants right now. Kristen Gillibrand and Cory Booker did this delightful video together because they are friends oh, in real life. Oh, it was beautiful. I yeah. saw you share this. And Joaquin Castro has been in conversation with them. They are clearly like friends. Like there, It is available to us. It does not have to be the way it has always been. You know, I think that that is something that we just have to constantly be reminded of. Yeah, and I think that similarly, you kind of open your book with this idea that we should talk about politics. And in many ways, I hear that as we should engage on a relational level. Like we should actually step into this instead of avoiding it and then doing it in kind of a more uh, relational way. The second thing that you kind of say when you dive into that next chapter is this idea of taking off your jersey. And this is something I've been trying to think about a lot as I think that the 2016 election really maybe entrenched people really strongly in their views. People who maybe wouldn't have doubled down on one side or the other really did. I think that, that that's something that I'm a little bit nervous about in the future, but can you dive into this idea of, of what it means to take off your jersey and, and kind of play out this sports metaphor? One thing we spend a lot of time on in the book is talking about how, again, we're just engaging with issues at a very surface level through the lens of where's our team on this? So it's not that I need to really understand what's in the joint comprehensive plan of action with Iran. It's that if Obama negotiated it, I'm either for it or against it. Mm. And what we're asking people to do is say, please recognize that all being a Democrat or a Republican means is that you are looking at policy positions that are animated by personalities. And you're getting really attached to these personalities. But your personality is important, too. And your values are important. So take a little bit more time and ask more questions and make sure that you understand all of the facts, not just what the personalities you gravitate toward. Think about those facts. I think the other thing that's really important with regards to taking off the team jersey is remembering that winning is not the most important thing. Just scoring a point is not the most important thing. Being better than the other side at all cost is not the most important thing. Just taking ourselves out of this zero-sum orientation of politics where if I'm winning, they're losing. If they're winning, I'm losing. Especially when we're just talking with one another. Look, some of our elections are winner-take-all. There's nothing we can do about that for now. There are some options on the table, but... Ranked choice voting. Hell yeah, ranked choice voting. (laughs) And so, you know, I think that that is one thing that when we think about it in that that Jersey highly competitive way, it's just really harmful because it changes the way you view the other person. It changes your sense of time. There's this really interesting book out right now that talks about the highly competitive nature of Congress. And when the when the Congress passes back and forth the way it has the last 20 years, it sort of shrinks the time span of the Congress people. Like they're not looking long term because they could lose the House in two years. So they're just thinking about the next day or, well, you can't plan long term for the health of our country if all you're thinking about is two year spans. Infrastructure is something that takes decades. It takes a really long view of the world and of the country. And if we're so highly competitive with one another that we're just thinking about the next win and the next political point to be scored or even the next election, then we're neglecting the long view of history and the long view of the health of our nation. We're definitely neglecting things like climate change that will take decades and decades to sort of move the needle on. You know, that's that's what gets lost when you orient yourself like that. What can we do to kind of encourage more of those long-term thinking? Like, is there something that we can do as as people who aren't in the United States Congress to encourage more long-term thinking? I think we've got to show up for our representatives when they act in bipartisan ways. You know, right now as voters, 
I don't think our politicians today are lesser human beings than their predecessors, and that's why things are more polarized. I think we as voters are more, more polarizing. We reward more polarized behavior. And so we've got to reward bipartisan action. If your congressperson is of a different party than you but votes uh, in a way that you think is helpful, you know, send a letter, send a check, volunteer, like be willing to cross the aisle in terms of who you support if good work is being done for you. To, to use the sports metaphor again, the reason jerseys are so problematic, it's like we we approach everything like a football game, right? But in a football game, the winner does not have an obligation to take care of the entire crowd when it's over. Mm-hmm. That's what our electoral system is. You know, representatives should represent the people who did not vote for them, too. But they can't do that if those voters disappear or just antagonize them on Twitter all day. And part of what we're really trying to say with this book is if we don't like this and we all say we don't, then we have to more meaningfully step up ourselves outside of elections to be there for our politicians and tell them what kind of standards we're going to hold them to. If there's anything I've learned in the last few years, it's been how to have those conversations with my elected officials or how to engage on different levels. It's so fascinating to me how easy it is to reach my local member of Congress. Like I can send an email, I can make a phone call and reach his office and know that that's actually going to get to him. Or I can actually reach him if I, you know, put a little bit more effort into it. And I'll try to basically call about the things that, you know, I know that they had to stick their neck out for, but that they aren't going to get a lot of attention about. You know, my elected official uh, recently did something really great uh, in the fight against HIV and AIDS. And so I hopped on the phone and thanked him. And the person said, nobody has said anything about this yet. So thank you for saying that. This was something that was a priority for us. And we thought that it was a priority for more people. And so I think that there's some cool opportunities there. And I think that it's true whether you have somebody that you align with or not. And I think if you pay close enough attention to anybody's policies, you'll find a lot of things you don't agree with, but you'll find a lot that you still do. And so that's an encouraging reminder. One of the other things that you kind of dove into is this idea of getting out of our echo chambers. And I think that this is something you address in the book, but this is something I've found. When having a political debate online or with a friend, when I go and look up data to to support my view, I'm literally doing just that. I, I look up data to support my view. I'm like, you know, if I'm talking about immigration and I'm talking about how... You're Googling immigrants commit less crime, just like I have. Exactly, exactly. And somebody could probably Google immigrants commit more crime and they're coming up with with probably articles and a whole, you know, Google search result page full of information. And what if I just said immigrants crime? Or even better, I like went into the hard data from, you know, whoever collects that data and dug into that myself uh, but I was wondering if you had other ideas on kind of how to push ourselves out of those echo chambers. One of the best things, and I don't even remember the listener who sent us this, but it was a really good advice that like, don't do a hard 180. Like if you are liberal, don't like start engaging with hours of Fox News or it's just going to make you mad and it's yeah. just going to harden your opinion and it's going to harden your heart. But like there are a lot of conservative outlets or liberal outlets that are not the sort of play to the caricatures we always know we always think of with each other. I think podcasting is a great way to do that to to listen to some voices that are that are different but not extreme so that you can can become acquainted with those ideas and and understand those experiences in a different way. Not to change your mind. What that's never what we're advocating. We're not saying go out and listen to the other side so that you feel differently about something. That's not what we're about at all. But we're to engage with curiosity so that you not only understand their experience, but you understand your own values better. That's the goal of exiting the echo chamber is to understand yourself better too and understand what's motivating you. Why is this issue important to you? And why do you get so emotional about this particular policy? So I think that that, if you can push yourself ever so slightly, not to be taken in, you know, Breitbart, but to, to get your feet wet in a way that's pushing you in a new direction. I also think you have to listen differently. I 
I try to listen for questions instead of answers, especially when I'm listening to a source that I know is not going to be 100% aligned with my views. So it's not that I'm listening to even understand their perspective better. I'm listening for just one moment that sparks a question for me that I've not thought about before. And I think if you can listen that way, it is a real invitation into all kinds of places that you've not gone. And then when you're talking with your friends who you know are listening to different things than you are and are in a different place than you, having that question to call up can open a new conversation with them. I think that that's something that I've seen you model really well on your show, especially the last few weeks where you've gotten to talk about abortion, which is such a fun topic and never Mm. hard to talk about and just always just a joy. (laughs) Total delight. Total Total delight. delight. Um, It's the first word I think about when I think about abortion. Yeah. (laughs) I think that if we've been on Facebook for the last few weeks, it's been this weird thing where you see people really, really, really describing the other side as you know, monsters, either hating women or wanting to murder babies. And you guys have done such a good job of of actually creating questions in me where I go, oh, what does that situation for that one woman look like? What does that one situation for this particular family look like? And it's, I don't know. I just want to say, I guess you're modeling that really, really well. And it's it's not easy. And it's also probably less good entertainment. I would imagine that you would get a lot more downloads on your podcast if you were going at it in a more divisive way. But I think that you're creating something that is what I naturally need versus what I naturally want. Yeah, it's deeply unsatisfying to end a conversation with a question. It Mm. is also, I think, the only path to growth and the only path out of this hyperpolarized situation that we find ourselves in. Especially with abortion. I think that topic in particular, we have found that people are so hungry, so desperate to hear someone say, I don't know. I don't know. I haven't figured out. I don't have the exact answer. I don't know who's evil on this side and who's good. You can almost hear a physical relief in their voices or read it in their emails. And so that doesn't make it any less scary or difficult to talk about those things. But every time we do it, this is what I always tell people, you know, every time we do it and the sun still comes up, I'm reminded like, yeah, mm. this is the work is that you you do it and then you do it again and then you do it again and then you do it again. Because when the answer is to engage in conversation, to ask questions, we're not going to come to an end point where we're going to be like, we fixed our polarized environment, everybody go <laughs> home, have a good night. Like, that's not what we're doing. We just had an expert on our podcast about race and he's like, we got to play a long game here. This took 400 years to get us here. We're not going to get out. And like a couple really great Atlantic articles. It's going to take a while. It's going to take a lot of conversation. It's going to take a lot of hard work. And we're going to have to keep doing it and doing it and doing it until we die. And then it will not be fixed because the problems we're fixing are not ones you solve in your lifetime. Something in me feels really hopeful that this could be the election where some candidates could really emerge and and attempt to do that to say, hey, I don't have all the answers here, but I'm willing to dive in and have conversations and listen But I also feel very hopeful that even if no leading candidate does that or the candidate that does that isn't picked, that that's something that we can all still model. And I know that we're all going to go to parties over the next, you know, two years and have conversations with people. And I hope to leave a lot of those conversations with more questions than answers and more people humbly admitting that they you know, don't know everything about this and and can't fully decide what the policy ramifications should be. I feel hopeful about that, too. And and part of that hope is generational, not to say that anyone is not invited to this table, because the best thing that can happen in the United States is for all of our generations to come together around this topic. I do think that there is something about the economic situation that millennials have experienced that creates more tolerance for uncertainty because it's it's not like, okay, you go to college, you get a degree, you get a good job, you have a 401k, you retire at this age. Like none of us expect our lives to be linear in that way. And I think that personal experience of there's just not one path and I've got to figure it out as I go and I've got to do something until it doesn't work anymore and then I'll change it. That mindset could be really helpful to dislodging some of these really entrenched political views. Beautifully said. As 
people are listening to this and they're, you know, they're excited to pick up the book and listen to the podcast. And they're also, you know, a little bit nervous about what this new election cycle might bring. Is there anything in particular that you want to leave people with? And specifically a task or a, an action step that our, our community can take to not only feel more hopeful about what's going on, but to become that hope as well. One of my favorite things Beth says is always, you just have to find your work to do in the world. There is not one answer. There's not going to be one person or one action or one cause or one policy solution. It's going to be all of us showing up in our very individual ways and finding the work that's important, finding the issue that animates us, finding the perspective that we bring that would illuminate a solution in a way nobody else could or no other group could. I think just finding a way to connect to a hopeful community, finding a way to connect to the sense that we're not in this alone, that we all are working to make the world a better place than we found it. And that doesn't always bubble up in the national media. Like that's not the narrative that they like to follow, but that doesn't mean that that story doesn't exist. Um, And so just being able to connect to that and plug into that and find your important work to do as a part of it? Yeah, that's such a beautiful question. I, I agree with that. I think one other suggestion would be to commit to looking for the value in perspectives that are unlike your own. So we talk a lot about how when it comes to federal power, Sarah is the gas and I'm the brake. Sarah is go, go, go. Let's use the tools of the federal government. And I'm saying, hang on, there's a danger in using that tool. Let's talk about it. Then Donald Trump was elected and I was like, oh, I might need to rethink some of this. (laughs) (laughs) And then in the private sector, I'm the gas. Go, go, go. How can we innovate? What can industry do to solve this problem? And Sarah says, hold on. I'm I'm coming in as the brakes to say, look what happens when we let private industry go completely unchecked. And we both belong in the car, that you need both of those perspectives on every topic And sometimes they have to give way to one another. You can't have the feet down on both pedals at the same time. And that framing has been so helpful to me because even as I read things that I just vehemently disagree with, I see the value in that other perspective. And I see the value of our tension and how if all Republicans were elected for everything that's really problematic. That's not a good scenario for anyone. If all Democrats are elected in every office across the nation, that's really problematic. We we need this tension. And so I think if we can just practice saying, I don't agree with that position, but I see its place here, that would be really helpful. It is always such a treat to get to talk with Sarah and Beth. I love what they're doing on Pantsuit Politics and also their other podcast, The Nuanced Life. If you loved this conversation, if you felt like it was barely scratching the surface of what you wanted to hear, I have some good news for you. You're right. Their podcast is amazing and dives into so many things. And every single week, they dive in and take a nuanced approach to whatever's happening in the world. And so the last few weeks, there's been some really interesting conversations, like we said, about abortion. I think that they're kind of talking about what's happening in Virginia right now. There's a whole lot of nuance to be found. And I think that it's really important that we all dive into it. And it also just makes me feel a whole lot more sane week to week. So check out Pantsuit Politics, The Nuance Life. But most of all, check out their new book, I Think You're Wrong, But I'm Listening. It is a wonderful tool. I'm really looking forward to using it over the next year. I've got tons of things underlined in it, and I'm probably going to start giving it away as uh, gifts for, I don't know, maybe people I want to have political conversations with. We'll see. But oh my goodness, it was so good to get to have Sarah and Beth on the show again. If you're new to Sounds Good, you enjoyed this conversation, we would love for you to stick around. Make sure to check out my previous episode with Sarah and Beth. But also, you know, I think you'd also love my conversations with Miles Adcox, who runs an incredible company and center called Onsite. And he and I shared a great political conversation together on this show. And also with Ken Weitzma, who uh, I shared a great conversation around race inequality with. And if you want to kind of dive into those topics, you can find both of these episodes and more than 100 other episodes by searching for Sounds Good wherever you listen to podcasts. 
And while you're there, make sure that you hit subscribe and leave us a review. It really helps people find the show. This podcast is created by me, Brandon Harvey, as a part of Good Good Good. We are a community that believes in the power of celebrating good news and becoming good news. Chad Michael Snavely and the team at CM Studio edit and mix this show. You can get lots more hopeful stories on social media by following us everywhere at Good 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 CO. And we also create a beautiful quarterly newspaper that celebrates the people, ideas, and movements that are changing the world for the better. It's a real life newspaper. You can order it today as a gift for somebody else. You can pick it up for just you. You can do whatever you want with it. Check it out and see what else we do at Good 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 by visiting goodgoodgood.co. And on that note, that is a wrap for this week's episode. Go out and take off the jersey. Dive into some nuanced conversations about politics. And we'll be back next week with another inspiring story from an incredible person. Sound good? 